the people who um, so there are a few people who who agreed to um, to to answer an exam question that Eric Eric and I composed. I think that's how it was characterized characterized by Keith Crable. Said, "Don't you have enough students?" So <laughs> so maybe not. <laughs> Or you guys are exceptionally strong students. Um, so while they're while they're being seated, um, let me uh, let me read to you the charge that the um, that this August August panel was given. Um, so they were um, they were asked to reflect on the the following questions. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, I, I won't read the preamble. I'll just get right to the questions. Uh, two of them, um, which they're 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 going to give brief comments on because we have many, but actually whatever they want to do is fine with me. Um, first, what interesting, non-obvious, and important thing have you learned either from your own research or that of others about legislatures, representation, or parties? Question mark. We are looking here for something, one thing. We have to give it some shape um, that you think of as a reasonably securely established empirical or theoretical finding. Okay, that's the first part. This is why it's like a comp question. Two. What is the most interesting and important open question in the study of legislatures, representation, or parties? Okay. Then this is the most ridiculous part. Um, would you be willing to prepare? <laughs> An approximately three to four minute answer. <laughs> okay, right. That's ridiculous, obviously. But um, but what can you do? You have to say something. So they're going to say whatever they're going to say. No one's going to stop them. Um, but that that was the that was the charge, and um, and so I'd like to now turn it over to to this. Uh, I mean, shockingly great uh, great collection of scholars. saying you must have written to the wrong person and that's I'd be perfectly happy for you to write me back and say whoops I didn't mean you I meant any one of the many people I've I don't study legislatures or parties <coughs> or representation and in fact as I will say in my comments tomorrow I never did take a class with David Milgram. Right. Uh, so I don't know quite why I'm here but having <coughs> having been asked to do this um, I was driving down this morning listening to P.G. Woodhouse uh, story on tape and thought about what I wanted to say so uh, wh what I think I've learned from reading <coughs> all of your work, since I don't produce this kind of work, um, and many, many years of conversation with David and teaching the American Politics Seminar and so on, uh, is how complicated the idea and practice of representation is. And I want to make a couple comments about what I think is problematic about representation as practiced, at least in the United States Congress or the United States legislatures, and then a few comments about what I think we don't really know or haven't really thought hard enough about. Um, representation is obviously, and I, you know, I start with Madison Federalist 10 or various Federalist papers um, and work my way through political science more recently. Uh, clearly representation as a governance structure is necessary if you've got more than 50, 100, several hundred people. So this is not an argument that we ought to have deliberative democracy or direct democracy or something else instead. It seems to me representation is essential. Uh, it's also, of course, essential if you have more than a few very simple ideas that have to be decided about. Either you have many ideas or the ideas themselves are complicated or they're interactive in certain ways. So this is not an argument for referenda. So it's not an argument against representation. But I think what we know is that representation, again, is very complicated and not terribly effective. Uh, it's not only necessary, it's also desirable. Uh, and again, this is kind of straight out of Madison. It expands the arena within which you can have governance. Think back to Federalist 10. You can expand the number of states to the geographic arena. Uh, it brings in many more perspectives than almost any other system could effectively do so. It filters the views of constituents. That's more Hamilton than Madison, but it begins there in the Federalist Papers. Uh, it provides the uh, sustained focus on complex issues which themselves are difficult to make decisions on and which are interactive and which change over time. So the logic of trustees is, I think, a very serious part of representation. We know all of that. But it's deeply inefficient and in many ways deeply undemocratic and perhaps even <coughs> deeply ineffective as a structure of governance. Uh, for example, I mean, if you have a single member geographic district, as of course you mostly have in the United States, uh, 
roughly speaking, half of the potential of the constituents don't get the person they want. Uh, if you have a landslide, maybe you have 55, 58, 60 percent uh, support, but still two-fifths of the people don't get what they want. So at a very simple, purely arithmetic level, it's a sort of non-democratic or ineffective or inefficient kind of uh, democratic process. Um, lots of substantive topics get bundled in single member first past the post type districts in ways that people wouldn't necessarily bundle them on their own. Uh, I learned this partly from Bob Lane, uh, who made me think about it initially, partly from my own interview work, partly from lots of other work that other people have done. I mean, for example, two simple examples of that. Social conservatives uh, have, rather to my surprise, relatively effectively, but also uncomfortably, allied with market conservatives, who are often closer to libertarian, in what we call the Republican Party <laughs> over the last you know, 30, 40 years. I mean, it's, it, it's worked, but it doesn't make much sense. If you stand back, why you would think a deeply religious kind of conservative ought to be in the same kind of party as a deeply libertarian or market-oriented conservative. Uh, they are, and they have figured out how to make it work pretty well, but there's no intrinsic reason why they ought to be in the same party. When you vote for a representative, that's the bundle you get, and so you can't pull them apart. Um, on the liberal side, there are, and you see the tensions in the, in the Democratic Party on this, that sort of liberals who are very concerned about American low-skilled workers, disproportionately but not necessarily people of color, are also bundled in the same party as people who are advocates of increased immigration of low-skilled workers. So you see competition among constituencies within the Democratic Party. There's no obvious reason why they ought to be in the same party, but they are, and that's the only choice you have as a, as a voter. Uh, so just, and, and the other th reason I think representation is profoundly inefficient or ineffective in a democratic sense uh, is that it's simply impossible for most people to express or see expressed in their legislature uh, a variety of their own identities that matter to them. Um, so if you're a white male, you have a larger, larger proportion of representation. If you're a black male or a black female or a white female or an atheist or a deeply religious Muslim, uh, it doesn't have to be race and gender, um, uh, but that's typically how we think of these identity questions. Class, almost by definition, uh, people who are not at least middle or upper middle class are never represented in their, their identity is never represented in a legislature. So representation seems to me, what one of the things we know, starting again with the Federalist Papers, but through lots and lots of political science, is that it's necessary, it's desirable, and it's not, doesn't work very well from a perspective of kind of democratic participation in democratic decision making. So one of the open questions that I would like to us to think more about collectively uh, to grow out of what I just said. Uh, so what, there's an empirical question, a normative question, and a political question. Uh, the empirical question is can in fact representation be made any more effective in the language that I'm using, any more efficient, any better at in fact representing either a larger proportion of people or a larger proportion of things people care about or disaggregating things so that people can get the things they care about but not some of the things they don't care about or that they oppose. Uh, we're not likely to change the electoral structure of the United States to, to <coughs> proportional representation process. Uh, we need more comparativists to tell me whether actually <coughs> PR would in fact be more representative in the ways that I'm talking about, but that isn't gonna happen, at least in any large scale sense in the United States. So it seems to me an empirical question is, are there any kind of other kinds of institutional fixes? Uh, cumulative voting, more referenda, uh, some other way of thinking about representation within the existing constitutional <coughs> structure and within a kind of plausible political system that would resolve some of the issues that I'm talking about. Uh, the other question I think within the empirical realm is does anybody who has any power actually have any incentive to seek institutional fixes if anybody were to concur that this is a problem as I'm saying? The answer is no, of course. By definition, if they have institutional power or have a, a a political power, they have managed to work their way through this institutional system that I don't think is very effective, but works for them. So there's no reason really to think that anything as dramatically is gonna change. But I think political scientists ought to spend a little more time thinking about what could perhaps be different and seeing if we, if we around the edges we could do something different. Normatively, how much is there, is there a problem of the kind of what I'm calling inefficient or ineffective <coughs> representation? Well, one answer is not very much. Uh, there are lots of other things we ought to be worrying about. May, most people don't actually care very much. As Bob Dahl put it in Who Governs, homo politicus is a fairly small category. People who do care do in fact have access <coughs> to representatives, if not representation. There is in fact a lot of slack in the system, also revert back to Who Governs. 
Um, people can find representatives outside their own district. So that again, African Americans can find the people, and if you have black legislators, they will see themselves as responsible to the black population as a whole in addition to their own constituents. So maybe it's not that big a deal. The things I'm worrying about don't matter to very many people. There are at least short-term fixes. Or alternatively, it is a big problem. <coughs> um, maybe if people felt represented, represented more, they would care more. Maybe that the causal error goes in the other direction. Um, that they don't feel represented, so therefore they don't care, rather than they don't care, so therefore they don't worry about representation. Uh, we know from Marty Gillens, Larry Bartels, Newman and Griffin, there's a whole lot of work that shows, in fact, considerable and systematic and persistent and important inequality of representation uh, by the criteria we would expect, uh, race and class most obviously, but again, also gender, non-citizens, the deeply religious, atheists, there's lots of categories for whom we might want to worry that representation simply doesn't work very well. Final question that I think we could do more work on is politically, would it, would it make any difference if somehow representation became more efficient or more effective? Um, again, there's two answers here. Uh, one is no, that there are fundamental budgetary constraints, there are party discipline, there are foreign policy imperatives, there's a variety of things. It, would, it basically would say that if we elected people differently, if we had representation somehow different, it wouldn't make very much difference. It would at the margins, but not in any serious way. Uh, the <coughs> other answer is yes, um, human agency matters that if you think you have a representative, you care more about politics, you are more engaged. If a representative is chosen somehow differently and thinks of constituents differently, they would actually behave differently. Or simply if different <coughs> people are in office, they might behave differently. So I think there's a few things we know and lots of things we don't know about representation. Thanks. Um, the picture of American politics that's come <laughs> into focus for me in the last 40 <laughs> years or <laughs> the last 39 years since I showed up down the street as a 17-year-old um, is literally a picture, and it's one that entails all the aspects of the political system that Mayhew has taught us so much about that Alan squeezed into his exam question for us. Um, I didn't bring a copy, uh, but you've all seen various versions of it. There are lots of them floating around. I, to my embarrassment, don't know who was the first person who actually presented this sort of picture. But it's a picture in which the horizontal dimension has something about the preferences of constituencies, whether it's measured by survey data or measured by presidential election votes or something um, from left to right along an axis. And the horizontal dimension has something about the policy choices or policy outcomes of individual representatives or of the process separately for Republicans and Democrats. And what that picture looks like is that there are two lines, both of which are gently upward sloping and with a big gap between them. Um, that I think is kind of the fundamental picture that you most want to convey to a beginning student about what the American political system is like. Um, there's a less famous analog uh, of that picture for presidents, which I take from the macropolity, although if you read the text of the macropolity, they don't make a big deal of this. They have an analysis that relates the mood of the country to the policy output of the, the White House, um, which if you actually look at the coefficients in the book has very much that same <coughs> character. There's a upward slope, which is to say that policy is more liberal when the mood of the country is more liberal and more conservative when the mood of the country is more conservative. Uh, but that effect is really pretty small in magnitude by comparison with the difference that you observe in policy outcomes between a typical Democratic president and a typical Republican president. So I think in terms of the actual picture, you would get something if you graphed it that way, very much like the picture that's become pretty familiar uh, for Congress. That picture has sharpened over the last 40 years, but if somebody had sat down in 1973 or 1974 and drawn the picture, it really would not have looked great and different. You would have seen that same qualitative picture. But we didn't see it then. People weren't looking for it then. Why is that? Well, I think a large part of the issue, a large part of the explanation has to do with the point that David just touched on in his charming little autobiographical sketch, Anthony Downs, um, that we had this view about how elections ought to work in which there was a very powerful moderating force that would push <coughs> elected officials to the middle. Um, and I think really one of the most important aspects of what we've learned over the last 40 years is that that moderating push is really quite weak. Um, it's especially weak now, but I think it was probably pretty weak even in the period where elected officials were behaving more moderately. They were behaving more moderately in ways that were consistent with Downs' theory, but I think probably not for the reasons that Downs was talking about. 
The other point I think that was important was the examples that we could point to or think prominently about in American politics at that period uh, of the elections of Goldwater and McGovern in particular, which seemed to, for many people, crystallize the lesson that um, ideological extremism would be punished by the elector. I think we now see pretty clearly that Goldwater and McGovern both lost mostly not because they were ideologically extremists, but because they were running in times where the incumbent was benefited by a strong economy. And so there was a kind of um, misattribution of those outcomes that reinforced this idea uh, that ideological moderation was a big pressure that was coming from the electorate. So now I think we've both convinced ourselves that that's really not such a strong pressure. Uh, and so we've observed members of Congress behaving in different ways as the panelists this morning have described. But why is that? I think the first explanation that was reached for by people who were inside Congress and were looking at the institutions within Congress was that party whipping and the party organization within Congress was a big deal. I think you know that's important, but it's not the main explanation for why these guys behave the way they do. The second ex explanation that people have reached to that I think is really fundamentally consistent in its spirit with the Downsian logic is that there are primary electorates out there, and they're the ones who are forcing these guys to behave more extremely than they otherwise would. Again, I think there's something important to that, but I don't think that's most of the story probably either. For one thing, if you look at the people who are voting in these primaries, they're not as extreme as the guys in Congress <coughs> sound. Uh, so I think there's probably more to it than that. Um, but one of the open questions that I think we should be working on is to understand better how it is that primaries do uh, when they do force this, the centrifugal uh, effect. Um, another big category of explanations that's received a lot less attention but I think would be deserving of a lot more work, uh, it's not something that we can do very well, I think, with the sharp analytical toolkit that David described. Uh, it will require a different kind of work, but that's to understand who these people are and what it is that they want and how they get to the point where they could be elected to office in the first place. The processes of political socialization and political recruitment and the broader <coughs> infrastructure of American political culture in which they come up, I think, has big effects on who it is that gets to that point and what it is that they want to do. And my guess is that a lot of what they do is stuff that they do not because they're single-minded seekers of re-election, but because they actually care a lot about politics and policy and they do what they think is right. And so understanding better why they think it is that these things are right and good, I think is an important part of our agenda. Uh, I came to uh, Yale in the fall of 1968. I was going to um, <coughs> study Western European politics, and I enrolled in um, Jolipa and Barr's class, and I lasted two weeks before I realized that uh, there was no way I was going to get to that level. Uh, I just didn't have it. And so I bailed out, started having long lunches with David Mayhew and taking Jerry Kramer's econometrics course, and my life went on to a different path. But with Joe sitting here, I want to report to him that I now teach comparative political behavior. <laughs> it's only taken me 40 years to learn what you would have taught me in a semester. Uh, and so there's, there's been some redemption in the end after all. What I want to talk about today is uh, very close to what my two smart friends to my right have just talked about, and that's uh, representation and some of the empirical difficulties there. I've had the pleasure recently of going back to the Miller-Stokes work on this topic, including uh, a fugitive but now in hand a draft of the early chapters of, of that book and it uh, led to some uh, rethinking on my part that I want to report um, here just briefly. We in Fourth of July rhetoric we take it as uh, uh, obvious that, there will, that if you hold elections the members of Congress who are elected will line up with the preferences of their constituencies and even those of us who know better um, when I listen to myself, I hear myself slipping into, into, that, into that language. But as Miller and Stokes showed, and as subsequent research uh, across Europe has demonstrated, that correlation is typically not too bad, but it's sure not overwhelming, and it's often uh, quite miserable. And there are instances of uh, political parties, the Republicans of the 1950s being a case in point, where the 
um, positions they were taking in Congress really didn't match up very well at all with the people voting for them. And there were examples of that um, across many other countries and, and, and time periods as well. Now, we know that uh, issues don't make much difference in, in elections most of the time. So there, uh, and, y and yet an, it, uh, an electoral connection surely exists. And as uh, Mark Melman was stressing this morning, members of Congress worked very hard on that, on that score. And there are certainly egregious examples uh, in uh, American political history and the history of other countries in which you, the electoral connection worked in the way that our Fourth of July rhetoric says it should. So Miller and Stokes in their famous article 50 years ago this spring talked about Brooks Hayes who represented the Little Rock area and got into trouble for being an honest broker in civil rights matters in Arkansas at that point and was thrown out of office for being too moderate. Uh, these days, <coughs> it's not clear how often that occurs. Uh, hiking the Appalachian Trail apparently is insufficient. Uh, you, you get put back into office if you're a, a suitable representative of, of your party. So this, uh, as, as we heard this morning, so this process induces some kind of policy correlation, but not all that impressive a one. And how is it forged exactly? And what is the causal mechanism there that causes it to work pretty well most of the time, um, but sometimes to just break down? I, I think we don't um, we don't nearly uh, we don't know nearly enough about that. Is party identification uh, central to that, uh, for example? So. Um, as we uh, continue to talk as a profession uh, about the electoral connection as a path that, that many people have, have written about, um, and uh, David Mayhew was influential for so many of us in, in, in writing about it. I still remember the very early draft paper uh, in which he was writing about that, as he, as, as he mentioned. Um, it was my, my first, in, in my first uh, intimation that even terrific scholars who write wonderfully don't necessarily have fabulous first drafts. And <laughs> that, that was, I thought I was the only one who, uh, who did that. And it evolved very rapidly and into, the, into the wonderful prose and powerful argument that, that we're all used to. But what he typed that uh, when he wrote it the first weekend. Uh, w wasn't all the way to what it, to what it later became, and uh, that made a huge impression on me at the time. So uh, in, in what, what I want to say is, again, similar to what was just been said by my two colleagues, but it is that we uh, not get too lost in thinking about the causal forces at work here, important as those are, but that we also spend some time thinking about how well the resulting process gives people the, um, the, the um, representation that they, that they want. And one thing it seems to me that uh, needs a little more attention than we've given it is a remark that uh, Francis Lieber made. Francis Lieber was a refugee from the 1848 revolutions in, in Germany, came to the United States, couldn't get, was the first real political sci American political scientist, couldn't get a job in at any of the uh, Tony institutions and wound up at the University of South Carolina. And he wrote about the importance of political parties in shaping what their uh, adherents think. And it seems to me that's been lost a bit and that thinking about the degree to which representation doesn't flow in quite the way we think it does on the 4th of July, but rather flows to some degree in, in the other direction. Thinking about that seems to me to be quite useful in spite of the fact that I also remember about Professor Lieber that um, living in South Carolina at the time he did, he knew John C. Calhoun. And like a good political scientist, he wrote constituent letters to his senator trying to help uh, that person understand how they should be voting. And Lieber kept writing about, you know, slavery really isn't as good as you think it is. <laughs> And maybe there's a metaphor there for how influential political scientists are. I got to say first off that um, I hate round tables. Uh, <laughs> erudition and eloquence just isn't in the central time zone skill set. Uh, nonetheless, there's an assignment, and I, I do what I do, so I wrote out my answer. Um, 
question one, most interesting, non-obvious, or important thing you have learned. Um, it will come as a little surprise that my answers reflect my tastes and what I'm currently working on. So I don't intend to, uh, to defend that this is the most interesting or the most important thing we've all learned, but this is an interesting thing that I've learned, and that is the following. Legislative rules, precedents, and even many norms are remarkably durable, even when they are very conspicuously endogenous. I'll repeat that because it's a little bit long. Legislative rules, precedents, and even many norms are remarkably durable, even when they are very conspicuously endogenous. The reason I find this generalization interesting is because thinking about it has, um, uh, thinking about it and working on it has such a broad assortment of spillover effects on other aspects of life, uh, many of them not political. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, from an early age, um, I learned about endogeneity of rules by inventing and playing games with my brother. Um, and usually these involved a piece of wood and some spherical object. Uh, and the, the games uh, 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 took on very, um, very ornate and baroque um, rule-based features. Um, another example is collective choice in an uneven family where n equals four. Um, think about it for a minute. Um, when you've got a collective choice with four voters, you've got a filibuster pivot, a veto pivot, and a median pivot that's all the same person. And that, uh, that leads to some interesting possibilities, and the, the outcome of which is we don't vote. Um, uh, uh, more seriously, um, 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 endogenous collective choice is useful uh, in doing things like thinking about the trade offs and teaching about the trade offs. Uh, between utilitarianism and fairness when teaching business, ethic, business ethics, uh, and likewise contemplating the trust foundation for paper currency of a global economy. Uh, these uh, seemingly unrelated things are actually related, so I'm, I'm not sure whether this will sound silly, self-important, or maybe deranged, uh, but I actually think that if one uh, gets a good enough handle on endogeneity of congressional procedures, you can pretty much solve most of the important problems in life. Um, um, so the most interesting and important open question. Uh, I, I didn't try to shirk on the assignment, but it just came out that A2 follows directly from A1. So because it's essentially the same answer, I'll spin it a little bit differently. Uh, one thing I've learned over the years as a congressional is that as congressional scholars get older, they get increasingly curmudgeonly about Congress. Uh, I'm getting older. Uh, so be forewarned that the premise to this answer is um, um, a cynical view of the conventional wisdom, and you don't have to buy into it 100% um, to, to, for, the, for the question to be good. Uh, I myself buy into it only about 83.4%. Uh, the average US legislator seems to be short-sighted in almost every way. Rather than fight the long fight, he tends to cave to pressure from special interests. Rather than invest, institutionally, in, invest in institutionally productive activities, uh, in the capital, that is Mayhew's institutional maintenance, for example, uh, she allocates a large fraction of finite time and effort to the next election, travel, fundraising, home style activities, et cetera. Because extra legislative opportunity costs, members of Congress are able to study issues and develop influence independently and grounded in political expertise. At best, they bone up just enough to get in front of the nearest camera with the vacuous to party talking points, uh, a la uh, the paper that Francis presented this morning. Then it's off to the next fundraiser, home for the next weekend, or maybe on to the next quick kill issue, which means another position taking opportunity rather than making policy. So when finally it comes down to moving, legis um, um, finally when it comes down to passing legislation, um, there are also op ample opportunities for short sighted behavior. Uh, to exploit the rules for immediate benefit. Why? Because you can. Uh, yet there are things are different, it seems. The open question is then, why are endogenous legislative procedures not changed regularly to meet overwhelming short-term goals? Um, uh, so basically, legislators are short-term oriented. They have opportunities to change goals to meet immediate needs, but for some reason they, they seem not to, more often than not. Uh, I think that's a, a, an important puzzle.
um, that if, if it can be solved, can help solve a lot of other problems and learn a lot about other institutions as well. I'll just put a code on that very quickly. Uh, in one of my all-time all favorite articles in political science, Jerry Kramer makes a distinction uh, that I've always found useful in PhD, uh, PhD classes. The distinction is between learning and understanding. So Kramer says that theory, uh, by which he meant formal deductive theory with explicit and rigorous assumptions, is the source of and hence is sufficient for learning. And likewise, empirical knowledge, observation, is sufficient for learning. But it's only when you combine learning and understanding, it's only when you combine theory and empirical work that you uh, reach, you, you, you extend beyond theory and get to a level of understanding. Uh, and I think that um, uh, we've learned a lot about legislative rules in the last few decades, beginning around the time David Mayhew sued it up for action. Uh, but I think uh, we still don't understand legislative procedures in the deep sense of Kramer, uh, and yet I think they are central importance to understanding legislatures and political institutions more generally. I also think it's not a fluke that the two questions that Alec and Eric pose respectively are about, number one, an important thing that you have learned, and number two, an open question. That is something we still know something about but don't yet understand. Mm. I'm, uh, in a sense, doubly embarrassed um, at being at, at, on this round table. I do like round tables because I'm on the gaseous side of the uh, uh, <laughs> continuum. But the, um, uh, I'm embarrassed to be sitting between uh, Keith and Bob, who for so long have done so much theoretically and empirically to shape a field in which I'm pretty much still a, a young newcomer, not young in other ways, but young in, in that ways, and a bit embarrassed to be answering uh, comprehensive exam questions when, in fact, I'll confess I never had to take a comprehensive exam in political science because I earned a degree in history. So the, <laughs> I'm, I'm doubly um, uh, vexed here. I earned uh, a degree in political science here, and I didn't take comprehensive exams <laughs> either. So. Well. The, um, and I should also perhaps add, just by way of a very brief introduction, that I come to the study of Congress uh, through uh, sets of questions in the subfield of American political development that I found I couldn't answer without grappling with uh, Congress. Questions about race and the liberal tradition, questions about social democracy, questions about state building, questions about temporality. Um, Etc. all of these uh, central themes in the subfield of American political development, a subfield which I come to believe and am uh, in print with John Lipinski and others in saying has paid not enough attention um, uh, to Congress, uh, not to speak of political historians who rarely write about um, Congress. And my main interests in, um, in working on Congress are less with the institution as such, though it interests me and fascinates me, than with uh, substantive questions about um, outputs of lawmaking and how they shape and reshape the nature of the American polity. Now, to answer the first of the two questions about the interesting and important things I may have learned, um, as many of you know, I've, um, I've been focusing my work um, on uh, representation and representatives from the South and their role in national politics. Uh, inspired um, in the first instance by V.O. Key's chapters on Congress in Southern politics. And as it's worth recalling, um, from the founding until the mid-1960s, these representatives were selected by a limited electoral a citizenry and nearly to a person strove to maintain regional autonomy in matters of race. This was true of members from the 15 slave states before the Civil War and the 17 states that practiced mandatory racial segregation after Oklahoma joined West Virginia as a new state with a formal legal hierarchy of race relations. And after the Voting Rights Act, these states underwent three decades of partisan transformation that ultimately shifted, as we all know, the region's embeddedness in the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And it's that process, I think, that um, as Richard Bensel's question um, uh, pointed to, fundamentally underpin um, many, if not all, of the uh, uh, trends that we saw in the fascinating panel this morning. 
Now, in my own work on the New Deal and Fair Deal, I was both surprised and impressed by the decisive and changing role of Southern Democrats, both in temporal and substantive terms. From the NIRA to conscription, from soldier voting to the various national security acts, crucial outcomes depended on how those representatives assessed the implications of national policy for the distinctive Southern social, economic, and political system. These capacities, moreover, were not constant. Temporally, there was a shift from being a veto group when they composed a minority of the majority party after the 1932 elections to being the most active shaper of lawmaking after Southerners became the majority of the majority party uh, after 1938 and in the 80th Congress, the large majority of the minority party. In analyzing their role in shaping modern America, I found the conceptual language of parties, factions, and regions to be inadequate, nor is the familiar organization of congressional behavior based on ideal points in two dimensions sufficient as it leaves unexamined the intensity and content of preferences and their lexical ordering. And to the second question, more briefly, what is the most interesting and important open question? I put down the following, which I'll read. It is an old question that remains painfully unresolved. In the early 1950s, Bob Dahl identified atomic energy as an issue in which, and I quote, the political processes of democracy do not operate. By that he meant legislative processes. And he concluded that short article by projecting that this zone would grow. How to think about the role of the legislature in national security matters remains insufficiently explored. Of course, we know a lot about delegation and a lot about the assertions of executive power. But is this now a permanent zone of what Clinton Rossiter once labeled constitutional dictatorship? Both normatively and substantively, what should be the role of Congress in this sphere of issues? These issues are related to the policy makes politics literature identified with Ted Lowy and the students of substantive representation, such as David Brady, Augie Clausen, David mm -hmm. Mayhew, and Barbara Sinclair in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, colleagues who sought to understand how congressional behavior alters by issue areas. But from the perspective of democracy and democratic theory, National security raises questions that transcend and supersede the tools and analyses that that literature elaborated and hence remains an open question. Bob. I feel like an orphan at the end of the round table. In fact, I don't even have any table here. <laughs> 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 so as, as I understood the charge it was from Alan was to say something briefly and sort of in, something sort of interesting and at the same time empiric, empiric, empirically accepted and those struck me as contradictory things. <laughs> so <coughs> what I thought I would do is offer two, some, some arguments for two seemingly contradictory things which I both believe and uh, although really not contradictory and that, <clears throat> therefore there's a chance you might find them interesting or at least controversial and possibly empirically accepted. I don't know, at least one of the two of might maybe. So th th they're both related to, uh, to the current electorate and polarization. One argument, one thing I want to say is something about is about what you find if you look at the national election study and look at how voters view the parties in terms of relative to themselves ideologically, okay? So what's basically a, a, an argument that there's a heck of a lot of sorting going on as we all know and perhaps more than you thought. And secondly, at the same time, that there's a lot of desire for divided government, perhaps, uh, perhaps because of the growing polarization. So <coughs> uh, first, so let's say, look at the American, American National Election Study, take the 2008 study or any years going back the past couple of decades, maybe a whole bunch of years, and, and you look at only those voters who by whatever standard you're using, no, the Democrats are to the left of the Republicans. That's your standard for ideological literacy, whatever you want to call it. Okay, ideally you might want to take about four different issues if, they're, if, they're, if the data is available for that study. And so, so these are voters who place the Democrats to the left of the Republicans, and the question is, where do they see themselves relative to the two parties? 
Okay. Of this group, it may be roughly half the electorate. Uh, the other half don't know or something. Uh, that uh, one third see one of the parties just exactly where they want to be, just right, no matter how you slice it. Another third are in the middle, only one third. The other third are out there one of the extremes. In other words, one third left of the Democrats, one third right of the Republicans, pretty evenly balanced. Okay, that's how you do it. Now you look at my party, of course, and you see the Democrats don't make any mistakes. There's no, virtually no right-wing Democrats, no left-wing Republicans. They, they don't make mistakes. In fact, the Democrats are, more Democrats, are, clearly more Democrats are to the left, of, see themselves to the left of the party than to the right of their party, and, and, and Republicans to the right of their party. So basically, you can see this is sort of a, a generator of what we might say is uh, uh, the current politics. Now you say, what about the independents? We forgot about the independents. They're like a big share of the electorate, right? We forget about them. and they, they must be in the middle, right? No. The independents are the most polarized of all, in the sense that there's more independents either on the left or the right than Democrats or Republicans are on the left or the right. Not by a big amount, but it's surprising that this, this is true. So in other words, there's a lot of people out there on the left or the right who are, call themselves independents but haven't ye, have yet to be sorted. And that, I think, is another interesting fact. So anyway, we have... Uh, so <coughs> the electorate is getting increasingly polarized in that sense. Okay. At the same time, we have, we have the d demand for divided government might be getting greater in the sense that uh, I used to like think of it in terms of a demand for uh, what I would think is ideological balance. And this is an argument that's familiar in the case of congressional elections and somewhat controversial, but the notion that the source of midterm loss is a demand for ideological balance, uh, so the way to block liberal Obamas to elect conservative Republicans and so on. But I think it's broader than that. I mean, I think, it, I think it's part of a general argument that people vote for one office conditional on what's going on in the other, so, or, or, th or what they expect to be going on in the other. So, for example, it works on for, so, for example, if you have a uh, de Democratic president, you expect Republican governors. Why are there so many Republican governors now? Because you have a Democratic president. Uh, uh, and, and so it works obviously across federal levels, and in fact it works across from top to from not only from president. I would say not, not only from um, uh, uh, president affecting Congress or other lower offices, but also lower offices affecting the presidential choice. So I'm working with one person in this room who probably doesn't want to be named, and we've written a paper that argues that that the vote for that who your governor is affects your vote for president opposite. In other words, if you have a re Republican governor in Wisconsin, Scott Walker, you're more likely to elect uh, Obama uh, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, and if speculatively it works, uh, speculatively it works um, uh, as a reason why we had so many Republican presidents for a long period of time. Why did we, why we have a Democratic electorate like Eisenhower, Nixon, and Reagan, and, Bo and Bush? Why did that happen? Contribute. Specu speculatively, of course, because we had a Democratic Congress. They elected Republicans in part to block the Democratic Congress. How did uh, uh, Clinton and then Obama have a relatively easy time getting reelected? Because they, at midterm, they lucked into a Republican Congress, which might have made it a lot, might have made it a lot easier. And just as a final comment about how ideological balance might seem to work, look at elections for governor as a function of vote for president. Uh, New Jersey and Virginia both have elections for governor the year after the presidential election. So that before the honeymoon even wears off, you might say, well, what's your initial expectation? Well, maybe they vote as the country voted for president the, just the year before, but no, they vote opposite. The last seven elections in New Jersey for governor, they voted opposite party of the president just elected. The last seven elections for governor of Virginia, opposite the party just elected president. Sort of, sort of counterintuitively, but so it's, it's an easy call to predict Governor Christie probably get reelected, but you might also expect a Republican governor of Virginia, if my theory is correct. Yeah, so anyway, there. <laughs> so uh, on the one hand, we have this force that's pulling the parties apart, obviously, separate from each other. At the same time, this somehow produces an, perhaps an increasing demand for, uh, for divided government or balance of some kind, uh, and that's that's my story. <coughs> Excuse me, one more. <coughs> Alan, I'm going <coughs> to skip part A and go to part B.
<coughs> yeah, I'll take one of those. That'd be good, yeah. I'm getting one. You're right. Maybe Jennifer can get you. <coughs> We're good, I think. Okay. Um, <coughs> it's about. The question is, I've forgotten exactly what the question is. It's something to do with what we, might be, what we might be thinking about or investigating or doing or rethinking. And I have a, there are a lot of answers, but this a particular one. It's kind of an itch that comes from teaching and reading these days. Not writing, I'm not writing anything about this. <coughs> it has to do with the, the, the Paul, Ros Paul Rosenthal roll call, congressional roll call data sets, which now go back two and a quarter centuries after all, which is a magnificent accomplishment. They, uh, so far as I know, un unimpeachable as a, though I wouldn't know, unimpeachable as an arithmetic or mathematical enterprise. <coughs> Somewhat separate from that is the interpretation of the data sets by imposing words on them or adapting them to ordinary thinking, ordinary usage of language, or ordinary conversations in politics. <coughs> and there, I think, with some, with there are some problems that we might give some attention to, to <coughs> improving the interpretation, so to speak, of the, of these, of this, this uh, widely influential uh, um, arithmetic or mathematical enterprise. I think there are a couple of problems. I think, I think there are a couple of problems of interpretation. One is this. <coughs> I think we need to rethink, rethink the, rethink <coughs> um, comparing levels of polarization across long periods of time by relying simply on the arithmetic of the Paul Rosenthal data sets. <coughs> Not an issue is whether we've got more polarization right now in some respects than we had 30 years ago. I think the answer is yes. And actually there are a lot of different data sets showing different kinds of things some of them put in front of us by Gary this morning, which show that, so it's really not an issue. An issue, I think, is, um, is looking over two and a quarter centuries. It's an um, American political development kind of thing, at least. And I think that uh, three problems, three distinct problems arise in making comparisons over a long period of time using just the arithmetic and in and, and employing such the phrase polarization without any prepositional phrases after it, such as among whom about what, but just plain using it as a gerund. Polarization. There's more polarization now than there was 50 years ago, there's less than there was 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Those kinds of comparisons are out there. We see if journalists make them and we make them. Three kinds of problems. <coughs> one is the familiar one of uh, sorting. This often we don't know or we're confused about whether we're talking about polarization between the parties in Congress or polarization to core, that is to say, regardless of whatever is going on regarding the parties in Congress. And there's a continual source of confusion, I think, in our heads there about that differentiation. Secondly, and this has been adverted to, adverted to today, at least in one respect, it's that the patterns can be, to a substantial degree, I think, artifacts of differences in processes, the way processes are happening. <coughs> now, the obvious instance there it for is that in recent times, the agenda control mechanisms are very different, and they tend to uh, blot out uh, nonpartisan or non-ideological differentiation. They tend to do that, probably. So why don't we think about that? How do we think about that? But this is not the only kind of process difference that could uh, cloud our minds. I, there are others, other possibilities. So you take 225 years, I mean, differences of customs of, in roll call voting or what kind of stuff is being voted on are probably of some importance. I remember reading some years ago a nice paper by David Brady, a nice paper, very elegantly done, about roll call voting, it's a time series, and he's, there's something going on in the 1940s, and damned if I know what it was. That is, there's some big change in the, in the pattern, and I had a suspicion that it was, that it, and this reflected on polarization or loaded onto it somehow, had to do with a, a change in the kinds of stuff they were voting on, different kinds of motions, they may be more often, often voting on this kind of motion rather than that kind of motion, or maybe doing it more commonly, I really couldn't tell. I wanted to look under the hood 
to see what they were voting on. What, what were the components of the data set for this Congress as opposed to that Congress in the kinds of stuff being voted on? That, that's point number two. There could be, again, uh, the differences over time could be at least partly artifacts of differences in process. But there's a third, I think, difficulty. It's this one, that the, <coughs> the data sets, the roll call data sets over uh, 225 days, they have a flavor of ordinality to them as opposed to cardinality. And by that I mean the following. It is the, where they will, they, they, they'll take the combat whatever it is in a Congress and put boundaries on it of zero or 100 and uh, play that way. But um, here's the intuition that um, <coughs> in common sense terms or in the way we do history or the way we think about life, a, a situation like the one in the 1850s where they're fussing about whether to go to civil war and kill each other in the hundreds of thousands, is a more polarized situation than is one where they're voting about whether they raise the minimum wage a buck or two bucks, which is the more common kind of uh, differentiation these days. And the arithmetic will not make that differentiation, or at least it won't make it very well or very much. And I can't, I, I can't get it out of my head that there's something cardinal going on here that it's just that the public is interested in and in thinking about polarization that is not measurable through the data sets, or at least not very measurable through the data sets. So I, I would guess that in common sense terms, the most polarized time in American history in Congress would be the 1850s. Um, but how do you show that arithmetically or mathematically? It's not easy to do implicitly there's a cardinal yardstick out there, and I don't know what it is or how to measure it, but I can't get it out of my head. I think we should just stop making comparisons over a century or two, saying on the basis of congressional roll call data that there's more polarization now than there was then, a century ago or two centuries ago, without being very clear to put on some prepositional phrases and some qualifications showing exactly what we're doing. That's point number one. That's argument number one about uh, interpretive. The other argument has to do with the, <coughs> the content of uh, roll call cleavages, or for that matter, of the whole roll call casting world of experience over 225 years. That is to say, the issue content. How do we think about that? And how, do, how, do we, how do we label it? How do we label it? We get a dimension out of it, after all, a first dimension, a second dimension. How do we label it? I think that's a very complicated kind of enterprise to put labels on a dimension going back along periods of ways. For example, to take it back a century or a century and a half, I think this is an extreme instance of analytic difficulty, I think, or conceptual difficulty. That is, the terms liberal and conservative, they just play don't work in the U.S. as, 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 as presented in, in the 19th century. It, they just don't work. Uh, nor does left free right work in its European sense of work with 19th century differentiation. You know it works here and there now and then. You can play with it, but I think Karl Marx was rooting for Lincoln and the, the Republicans in the 1860s to give a clear example of uh, oddity going back that far. Um, that's an extreme instance of a labeling difficulty, but the problem is more, is more general. And what we know, it seems to me, about the roll call patterns is that there are um, alliances of people against each other and that they, tend that they tend to persist, not just within Congress, but over a period of at least short periods of, of several Congresses. And that's very revealing and very important to know that, after all. But we don't know, except by looking carefully, um, what those alliances or the issue contents of those alliances are. It is, it's, we just, we have to look. We just, we should be very careful about adjective, using adjectives and nouns. I mean, one way to start, and my, often a frame of mind for me in dealing with this, is, is that an, an ingoing stance of extreme nominalism on these things. They're the same issue by issue by issue. I mean, it's uh, issue by issue by issue. It's uh, just look and, and be very careful about uh, generalizing about content over, um, over even the, you know, a decade or two decades or three decades, the conservatism is not what it was in the 1840s, 19, 1940s, forget about the 19th century, it's just not, it's not the same thing. Liberalism is not the same thing it was in the 1950s. And we should know this and think about it. 
<coughs> Great, well I'd like to thank the panelists for a series of extremely thought provoking, I would go so far as to say, um, extremely deep and wise observations about uh, the state of our knowledge and exciting ideas for uh, what we ought to do and in the case of David's discussion, what we ought to stop doing right away. <laughs> so thank you very much.